What you will. And he is world famous because in November 2008, he gave an interview, a six minute interview, at which he cast some doubts upon the established view of history. Of history. Yeah. Now, because of that, he's faced four trials. Four trials in Germany over that. And they failed to convict him. What are they doing? They're going to have a fifth trial, starting September. Where? Where? September in Germany. No, in Germany. In Germany. Oh, see, they had a double jeopardy. Yes. So, um, he's an outspoken critic of international Zionism. He's, he's, he's been persecuted by them for this. And I don't really think he needs instruction, does he? So please put your hands together and welcome Bishop Williamson. Thank you, Jeremy. I was at one point a little reluctant to speak this afternoon because the um, theme of Hamlet, which I said it was the one I'd like to talk about, really doesn't bear on Palestine. It's to stitch together Hamlet and the Nakba is uh, quite a feat of stitching. <laughs> but actually, it is stitchable. If England were sane, this could not be happening to the Palestinians, which is happening. Mm -hmm. England is not sane. When did England start not being sane? at about the same time that Shakespeare is writing Hamlet. And Hamlet is actually the drama of England, and the, the drama of our greatest poet and our greatest playwright. He, um, he, for a moment, he picked up, Hamlet is the philosophy of Shylock. It wasn't what Shakespeare had been beforehand, and it didn't last. After Hamlet, he swung back on uh, the medieval course. But for the duration of Hamlet, he believed in vengeance and revenge, which is not uh, Christian. Which is not Christian. It is Jewish. The Jews are not ashamed of being a people that never forgive and never forget. They believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They are proud of it. And therefore, one's not accusing them of anything that they should be ashamed of when one says that they are a people that believes in vengeance. And they've been avenging what they took to be their sufferings during the Second World War, uh, ever since the Second World War. And they're still pursuing ancient guards and so on, now in their 80s and 90s. They're pursuing the last direct war criminals they will soon have to be pursuing the children of war criminals, simply because by being the children of war criminals, they are criminals themselves. Yeah, this is the incredible mentality. The incredible mentality. Uh, Milady, Milady Renouf said a lot of true things. I don't agree with everything. Uh, but she said a lot of true things. And um, the truest, perhaps one of the truest things she said was that we all of us need religion. Or that was the, she didn't put it like that, but that was the sense. We all need something higher. We all have to believe in something. I forget exactly how she said it, but that was clearly the message. Because, and um, like the last time I, I last when I last spoke at the London Forum, I do, do not intend to preach. I intend to argue. I'm not going to assume that any of you has the Catholic faith. I'm not going to assume that the Catholic faith is true, although I absolutely believe it's true, mm -hmm. but I will argue in its defense. In other words, the appeal is to reason and to history and to the evidence. The argument is not to a, a, a quality of faith which many of you surely don't have. The argument is you should have the faith. If you had the faith, if all of you were not only bloody-minded Brits, <laughs> which most of you are, most of us are. <laughs> if you were actually bloody-minded Catholic Brits, the Palestinians would not be in such a mess as they are. Here's a little schema. If any of these um, crayons still has any gas in it, 
Here are we know who. Here are the poor dumb Gentiles. The Gentiles by themselves are no match for we know who. No match. If we want to say it in a way nice to the Gentiles, we would say it's because we're too honest. We have too many scruples. That's a nice way of saying it. Because the implication is that. But what enables the Gentiles and what alone, this is a statement, and it's, it's, it's which I probably argue for, what alone enables the Gentiles not to be trampled all over, run rings around, dominated, controlled by these people, is the faith. The one thing that these people cannot handle is the Catholic faith. And I say the Catholic faith because all faiths disagree with one another on some point or another. Protestants disagree with Catholics about the Holy Eucharist, they disagree about the Pope, they disagree about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, they can't both be right. Let's, you know, either this crayon is standing on this desk or it isn't. It can't both be, this crayon can't be both standing on this desk and not standing on there is a law of contradiction or of non-contradiction, if you like, in reality. Reality is non-contradictory. Two realities cannot contradict one another. One of them will not be real, or let's say true. Two truths cannot contradict one another. A truth of reason cannot contradict a truth of faith. And a truth of faith cannot contradict a truth of reason. Because truth is one. Truth can't contradict truth. Only lies can contradict truth. That's, that's anti-liberal. Most people don't believe that any longer. Most people believe, ah, it's a matter of opinion. You, know, you think this, I think that. We're all nice. <laughs> Let's be nice. Uh, no. It's not a question of being nice. It's a question of being true. Um, what is life truly about? What is human life truly? What is the truth about man? What is the truth about God? These things matter. What's the truth about the next life? What's the truth about the human soul? Is the human soul immortal or is it not? It cannot be both mortal and immortal. That's not possible. It cannot be mortal for you and immortal for me or mortal for me and immortal for you. It's the same for all of us. Because we're always the same human beings. We've all got two legs, two hours, most of us a head, and so on and so on. We've got the same human nature, and the same truths must apply to all human beings. Either God exists for me, and in that case he also exists for you, or he doesn't exist for you, and in that case he doesn't exist for me either. And I'm just in, in, a, in the realm of kidology. I'm just kidding myself, I'm fooling myself, I'm pretending because I want to believe, because I need a cotton sugar daddy in the sky, because otherwise uh, uh, I'm unhappy if I haven't got my sugar daddy in the sky. It's a question of truth, it's not a question of emotion, it's not a question of feeling, it's a question of reality. Is the soul immortal or is it not, really and truly? And it can't be one way for you and another way for me. Either every one of us is going to answer judgment when he dies, or none of us. Either or. Not both and, but either or. People like today don't think like that any longer. People today in general don't think. And the reason why they don't think is because they made mincemeat of the law of non-contradiction. Mm. They don't believe in truth. They believe that everything is just opinion. Between their two ears, they don't have grey cells, they have mush. Yeah. Most people have mush in their heads. The faith is either true or it isn't. What the Catholic Church teaches is either true or it isn't. 
It can't be true for me and false for you, or false for you and true for me. No, not possible. But that's the issue. <clears throat> that's our issue. Whether it's true or not true. Yes, ah! Whether it's true or not true, that is the issue. I've said, I've said to them, here I'm arguing. All right, I'm going to argue. I'm not arguing, I'm reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to. Please wait till the end for questions. I'm not the answering end. questions, I'm just stating facts. Carry on, please, sir. The... The, the reason why, the reason, the reason behind this is that God, there is a God, all right? I don't necessarily believe if you don't believe it. There is a God who created every one of us. Uh, he created the immortal soul which is in every one of us. Every one of us is an, an immortal soul and a body. All right? Don't expect you believe these I'm stating them. So that you can get the, the complete picture and then see how somebody can say something like this. God creates the immortal soul at the moment that each of us is conceived when our human father and our human mother put together in our mother's womb the two material elements that are going to provide, put together the body of a human being. The human being is soul and body. The body is mortal. And when, when the, if the human being is mortal, the human being dies when the soul and the body are separated. When the soul and the body are separated, the body begins to rot, usually, nearly always. Though by miracle it can be kept incorruptible. But nearly always it usually begins to fall to pieces. Because the soul is the principle of life in the body, and when that principle is there, when the source of life is no longer there, the body begins to die and to fall apart. But the soul cannot die. The soul does not die and cannot die. That I'm stating, but, but you don't have to believe it. You, you, you may or may not believe it. I'm not assuming that you believe the things I'm saying. God creates us. The purpose he creates us uh, we, there are six layers. There's, there's God, there are the angels, there's men, there's animal, vegetable, and mineral. Uh, men occupy a very place, uh, number three, they <laughs> occupy a very special place because the man shares spirit in his spiritual soul with the angels and with the spiritual God, the entirely spiritual God, who's not material at all. The angels are not material at all, but man shares matter in his body with animal, vegetable, and mineral. Therefore, man is uniquely complicated. He's spiritual with the two layers that are higher than he is, God and the angels. He's material with the three layers that are under, under him, that are, that, are, that are less than he is. Man is therefore quite complicated, a mixture of body and soul. The body and soul separate to death, the body rots, the soul does not die. What God planned, plans, is for us to go to heaven. He wants us to, he, he creates, he, he, creation comes from his generosity. He created everything that we know and see in this world around us out of nothing, ex nihilo, from nothing. If, if you try to imagine the power necessary to, it's not imaginable, because we only know making something out of something. To make something out of nothing requires divine power. The uh, God creates the soul out of, out of nothing. The body is put together by the parents. God wants this soul and body to be happy with him for eternity. At judgment, the soul will be judged on how it has spent this life. At, during, the, during this, by the time a soul dies, and that may be after 10 years, 5 years, 50 years, 100, even 120 years, by the time a soul dies, then God is the master of the moment of God is the master of life, and he's the master of death. And even a suicide thinks he's the master of life. It's not the true, uh, the master of the moment of death, because uh, very often the suicide it doesn't work. Out of God's mercy, a suicide fails to kill himself because God gives him God. It's God who is giving him more time. If the suicide succeeds. It's God who has allowed the, the, su the suicide to succeed at that moment. God is the master and not we human beings. God want, uh, created all of creation, animal, vegetable, and mineral, and human beings, and the angels, in order to have people sharing in this infinite happiness in heaven. Uh, but he doesn't want only robots, he doesn't want robots in his heaven. He doesn't want people who will not have contributed themselves and who will not have wanted themselves actually to get there. Therefore, this life is 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, according to God's wise, infinitely wise judgment. This life is enough, even if I die at the age of five, it will have been enough 
for, for me to have arrived at the decision whether I want to spend eternity with God in his heaven or whether I want to spend eternity without God in his hell. Heaven and hell exist, heaven and hell realities. I don't expect you to believe that if you don't. But it, the, all of this in order to say that God creates us human beings in order for us to go to heaven. But it's got to be by our free choice. The first human beings, Adam and Eve, uh, fell. They had free choice. They were created in a very perfect state. They weren't torn by passions or distracted by, by sinful attractions like you and I easily can be. Uh, they, uh, they were created in a, in a perfect state, in a perfect balance and equilibrium. They did not have to fall. Uh, we all know who fell first, and we all know why he who fell second fell second. Because the poor man was tempted uh, by, I don't know any of us who, any of us men here who would have resisted the temptation, let it be said in brackets. Um, in any case, uh, she was more heavily punished. Both of them were punished because, and they were punished very severely because they did not have to fall. It was a completely free choice that they made. They were not dragged by their passions like you and I are. So, they were severely punished. But Eve was more severely punished than Adam because she not only sinned, she made Adam sin as well as sin. She both listened to the devil and made uh, Adam sin. Therefore, she has been, as Scripture says, under his power. She's had to be directed by, uh, directed by man ever since. And of course, if, if men and women are proud, I don't like being told what to do, I don't like being directed, I don't like being under anybody, and there we have feminism. Woman, woman yeah. not under man. Um, <coughs> not by Bernard Shaw. Uh, Frank, 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 Frank. Excuse me, Alfred. That's where, the, so out of, there's a lot of, there's obviously a great deal of pride in feminism. Be it also said, feminism is basically the man's fault. Because if the man, uh, if, the, if the woman is needing to be under the man, then the man needs to direct. It's the man's function to direct. It's the man's function to direct, to reason, to rule by reason. Um, in Christian marriage, that, that dominance is not irksome because of grace. But that's another story. In other words, the God did not, the, 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 the dominance of man over woman would have been even without original sin, but uh, if, if, if men and women are what they should be, that dominance ceases to be irksome. If they aren't what they should be, the dominance is irksome. Men, modern men are not what they should be, and women throw off that dominance because the men are not what they should be. Yeah, yeah. St. Paul yeah, says... Yeah, yeah, yeah. St. Paul says, as man is under the Christ, so the woman is under man. Understand by that, if the man refuses any longer to be under Christ, the woman naturally refuses to be under the man. If therefore modern man is without religion, it's not surprising if modern woman throws off his dominance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The key to all kinds of problems of modern life is the lack of religion. The lack of the true religion, not of any religion, but of the true religion. Because we come from God. We are creatures of God before we are members of society. God has to create me before I'm going to be a little embryo in my mother's womb. Before I'm going to come out of the womb, before I'm going to be a child, before I'm going to be an adult. Politics is men's relations to one another. Religion is a man's relations with God. As God comes way before men in the life of any single human being, so religion actually governs politics. And that's why, uh, 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 that's why the question of religion is crucial in this question of Palestine. The question of faith is crucial for the, the Gentiles not to be run rings around by the Jews. Now, why do the Jews uh, occupy this position? Um, I will give you the Catholic version. I'm not spinning these things out of my own head. I'm not expecting you to believe them just because I say them. I say them, I lay this out simply because there are certainly some of you, if not many of you, 
that might understand how this explanation fits the facts that you know. A Lady Renouf, a Peter Russian, know a lot of facts at ground level, so to speak, and more than ground level. But the, only at the highest level can you understand these facts at these lower levels, because the higher level dominates the lower level. As religion dominates politics, therefore, understanding these questions of religion is essential to understanding something like the sufferings of the Palestinians. What has happened? Adam and Eve fell, and from then on, this, the perfect balance and equilibrium and order of their nature was gone. Imagine a, uh, a house of cards. Uh, when I was a boy, it, we, I'm sure it still happens, you took eight cards and you put two together, you put another two, you put another two, you put another two, and you could build up to maybe eight stories. Actually, that's very fragile, and you just have to blow and the whole thing comes down. But imagine a house of cards which was very solid, very, very solid, which could come down, but it took a really wrong decision to pull it down. It took some real naughtiness, evil, wickedness, to bring it down. The house, as God constructed, the house of human nature was like the eight-story eight, uh, eight story house of cards. But, um, whereas a house of cards is fragile, the human nature was not fragile before the fall. But Adam and Eve destroyed, like you dis the house of cards, if it collapses, it's just a pile of cards. The cards are exactly the same, but their structure is gone. Human nature after the fall is, the, the, it's, a, it's a comparison, I'll give another comparison. Comparisons limp. That's a classic statement of the scholastics. Meaning a comparison has a good leg and a bad leg. A comparison limps. So you don't look at a comparison just for where it limps, you look at a comparison for where it's useful. The comparison between uh, a, an eight-story house of cards and human nature, where it is useful is that human nature was comparatively speaking collapsed with what it was before. At the same time, the, act the materials are all still there. So that in a way, human nature was exactly after the fall as it was before. In another way, it was, com it was, it was collapsed. Therefore, collapsed human nature. What is Almighty God going to do? Did Almighty God not foresee that Adam and Eve would fall? Of course he did. Therefore, what, Adam, what God foresaw also, and he, in Genesis you can see that he tells Adam and Eve that there will come a redeemer. That he, uh, the, 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 the serpent will constantly... Uh, bite her heel, but she will tread on the serpent, because a Eve's descendant, 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 comes down to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Blessed Virgin Mary gave birth, gave the human birth to the human nature of our Divine Lord, and the, the Savior, and therefore they, right at the, from the very beginning of the human race, God told Adam and Eve, they, you created a gigantic solution, a gigantic problem, but I have got a solution, and that solution will come. How did it come? It came, to the, the, the solution begins in a sense with God choosing the Jews. How odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> the um, uh, God chose Abraham out of the land. He pulls him out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, presumably because human nature, because of original sin, ever since Adam and Eve fell, human nature by itself is like a loose screw in a, tr in a, in a lorry. The moment the lorry goes on the road, the loose screw is going to get looser and looser until it falls out. You've got to keep tightening it up, uh, and then it will roll again, it will come loose. The, it, it, again, bad comparison, good comparison. A screw that will constantly come looser and looser if you don't tighten it up. On the other hand, most screws, of course, you can tighten up so that it won't come loose again. Bad point of the comparison, good point of the comparison is that the uh, screw needs tightening. Human nature has constantly got to be lifted up again because if it isn't, it's going to fall. Um, human nature fell in a thousand years, approximately from Adam to Noah. It fell to such a point that the Lord God had to wash out the human race and start all over again. Notice in brackets that that was not a cruelty. The flood is firstly a geological fact. Uh, uh, something observed by many geologists all over the world, the rock formations and so on and so on. Uh, the um, you know, little sea scallops are way up in the Rocky Mountains, way up 16, uh, 16 20,000 feet, or however many, it is, how many feet it is in the Rockies. It's a geology, it was a flood, it's a geology. Why was it not just a, a, a dreadful punishment? Because as the waters rose, 
Every single one of those human beings had, had time, still left as the waters were rising, he had time and free will to still say to Almighty God as though he means it, and maybe when the waters are rising you do mean it, Lord, I want to spend my eternity with you, I don't want to fall into hell. I'm very sorry for everything I've done, able to offend you. There's a possibility of making an act of contrition, a serious act of contrition, like the good thief on the cross, and that, therefore, it was not a, um, a cruel act, just destroying a, a mass of human beings, it was an act of mercy enabling, giving many souls the chance still to get to heaven, which they wouldn't have had if, they, if the corruption had gone on and on and on. Please, if this, if this uh, exposition is too disagreeable to you, please don't hesitate to walk out. You're not obliged to sit here and listen to this. This is, what I'm giving you is essentially church doctrine. The church doctrine behind, I would say, Palestine. The flood was an example of the human race descending in a thousand years, which what's the most likely was. You can't, that millions and millions of years of the human race is modern scientific nonsense. Modern science, whenever, whenever it steps outside the strict observation of material reality, modern science, when it tries to be theological or philosophical, the modern scientists talk frequently nonsense. Mm. The, uh, about a thousand years was enough for human race to so descend. God washes out and starts again. Except he starts again with eight souls, says scripture. Mr. and Mrs. Noah, Mr. and Mrs. Sem, Mr. and Mrs. Ham, and Mr. and Mrs. Japheth, and the whole the human race, uh, is all of us are not only descendants of Adam and Eve, we're also descendants of Mr. and Mrs. Noah through most of us probably Mr. and Mrs. Japheth. Uh, if we were Jewish, we'd be through Mr. and Mrs. Sen, of course, uh, and so on. Um, the, 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 God picks up the human race by, by the flood. Uh, several years later, the, 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 the descent is picked up again. God picks up by taking this, not by another flood, by taking Abraham out. Why Abraham? Abraham was a very great, very, very great man. Uh, with a, a, a stupendous trust in Almighty God. Which means that when the Lord God seemingly gave him the order to sacrifice his own son, he was willing to do it and to go all the way um, to do it. But God intervened at the last moment, of course, and saved Isaac. But the, the Abraham's faith had been put to the trust. Abraham is the father of all, of, all Jews and uh, Christians who have the faith. The uh, human race, uh, uh, that then the Jews occupy a special place. The race of Abraham, as Abraham, as a God prophet to Abraham, when he pulled Abraham out of all of the Chaldees, the Jews will play a special part. The problem is that they will we'll, we'll come to that. They, so there is something special about them. They are a theological race. They come, they were called originally by God to fulfill a godly function to be the cradle of the Messiah. The, the 2,000 years later, it would be descendants of Abraham, uh, especially the Blessed Virgin Mary and her two, her two parents, St. Joseph and St. Anne, who would provide the, the, the Savior with his human nature. The Savior would be a divine person with a divine nature that comes down to earth and takes a human nature as well. One person, two natures. The Savior, why does the Savior take human nature? Because he is going to solve the problem created, the tremendous problem created by Adam and Eve. Human nature is so wrecked by Adam and Eve that the screw will just always keep on coming loose, keep on coming loose, keep on coming loose. Uh, God intervenes with Abraham. He intervenes with Moses to pick up again the Jewish, the, the, uh, the people of Abraham. Moses picks them up again and takes them uh, through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. They need picking up again a little later with the Babylonian. They must be. They, 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 they need. They need the temple, and therefore uh, another stage is the Temple of Solomon, the first temple built by <coughs> King Solomon. And King Solomon governed an area which today's Jews want to recreate. Yeretz Israel, they call it. Mm. Um, the Jews are very conscious of having been for 2,000 years the chosen people. And we'll come to that. 
Uh, God picks them up again with Solomon. He picks them up again with Moses. He picks them up the last time again with Ezra, the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity and a great religious revival. But by the time our Lord arrives, the, this, these people have descended to, to the level of the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders. Notice that at the same time, they have, they have, this, this people have generated the, the two human grandparents of our divine Lord, St. Joachim and St. Anne, who are of an enormous human perfection to generate their Blessed Virgin Mary. Therefore, the, Jew, the Jewish people did not fail in their mission and divine vocation to act as the cradle and uh, birth and uh, birth uh, origin of the human nature of the Savior. The human nature, the, div the Savior needs a human nature as well as a divine nature. If he's merely a human being, if he is only a human being without also being God, he cannot possibly pay to God the whole debt owed by the mass of human sins. If he's not a human being, he can't pay by his own suffering because God can't suffer. God, God, God as God could not have suffered on the cross. In order to both be able to suffer and be able to pay, the one person, the one Savior needed a human nature and a divine nature. Therefore, he needed human ancestors, and God, the way in which chose, God chose to do it was with the 2,000 year, years running from Abraham to Jesus Christ. The Jews were very conscious that they were going to be the cradle of the Messiah. They knew that that was their vocation. Every Jewish girl worth her salt wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. Uh, then the Messiah comes, but the Messiah comes into a Jewish society led or misled by the scribes, the Pharisees, and the elders, the spirit of the Pharisees. One may well say that today's Jews are, do not have a drop of blood, of, of Abraham's blood in their veins. Many of them, that's probably the case. But they certainly have the spirit of the Pharisees in their mm -hmm. souls. The Kazakhs, or the Kazakhstans, or whoever, the Kazakhs, the Khazars, the Khazars abs absorbed the spirit of the Pharisees into them, and that's what makes them behave and think the way they, 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 they are today. What, what our Lord meant, our Lord never meant, God never meant, by choosing the Jews at the time of Abraham, that only Jews would benefit from the Savior. God meant the Jews to be the, 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 what St. Paul calls the pedagogue or the schoolmaster, so that to arrive at the Savior. But once the Savior arrives, as St. Paul explains in Galatians, then... The, the, the chosen people will no longer be chosen by their blood, the race to which they belong. They will be chosen by their faith. Whether they believe and trust in the goodness of God and the goodness of life, or whether they refuse to believe in that. The Pharisees and the scribes and the elders, the large number of them, refuse to believe, and therefore they kill our divine Lord on the cross. Because that simply fulfills the plan of, our divine, of, the plan of God which is that the, the one person will save, uh, will, will save by his sufferings and by his di divinity. By his divinity, suffering in his humanity, he will save. The, sa the salvation is there. The money is now all paid into the bank, and all that any human being, Jew or Gentile, from then on will need in order to save his soul will be to go to the bank and, and cash a check. But he's got to go to the bank. He's got to, he's got to cooperate. With the, his salvation has been worked. His salvation has been made available. But it will only be made real by his own choice of accepting what God has now made available to him. But the Jews at this point, the Jews have been for 2,000 years especially protected and they have been the people of God. They have had a real divine mission. They have had a real purpose. They've had a... They, they've had something really to be proud of. They misbehaved and then God has punished them. Babylonian captivity. Seventy years amongst the Babylonians. But when they came back from there, they never again committed idolatry. They commit idolatry before the Babylonian captivity. They commit other sins after the Babylonian captivity, but they don't commit again idolatry afterwards. The Jews have been, have been used to being the cock of the donkey. We are superior to the rest of the human race because God has entrusted us and given us special gifts for a special function. That function then happens, it's there, and then they refuse it. At that point, the, the, the scholastics say, corruptio optimi pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. 
If these people were the best, by God's choice and by God's gifts and by God's punishments, if they were trained and formed in a special way that the rest of the human race wasn't, then they, they, they did have privileges, as St. Paul again says in Romans. If you want to understand the whole question, read St. Paul. Read especially the Epistle of the, the Galatians and the Epistle of the Romans. There you have it laid out. That is the word of God because it's, uh, the scripture is inspired. You may or may not agree, but you may, um, uh, for St. Paul is not too easy to read, but you'll see there St. Paul goes into all of these questions because he, he faced them directly. He was converted by our Lord a few years after our Lord died, and he immediately ran, he began, became a great uh, preacher of our Lord after he was knocked off his horse, and he immediately ran into the opposition of the Jews. Wherever he went, he was persecuted by the Jews. In the second epistle to the... The first epistle of the Thessalonians, the second chapter, he says that they are enemies of God and of man. They are enemies of God. St. Paul, the word of God, saying that these people are the enemies of God and of man. And they want the Khazars at that point. But the Khazars have been here, taken over that spirit which St. Paul was recognizing in his persecutors. Therefore, uh, the, the, the Jews have, uh, uh, cannot accept that the rest of the human race is now being built into the people of God. They wanted a Messiah who would smash the Romans and make them, as, they are, as is their due, kings of creation. And to this day, they are still materialistic and they want a materialistic salvation. They are the masters of matter and the masters of materialism. If men cease to be spiritual, all that remains is material. If they make themselves purely material, they are sitting ducks for the masters of materialism who are the Jews, through especially, of course, money, banks, and banksters. But that, whose who's, who's fault is it? Whose fault is it to be, well, the, 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 that's another question. Uh, but the, the Jews, are, they, 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 with, with the privileges that they have had, they have as gone, because of our poor fallen human nature, they have a fallen human nature just as much as the rest of the human race, if not almost more so. They have fallen and their pride will not accept, cannot accept, that now the people of God is open to the whole human race, which it is. Eskimos, uh, Aborigines, uh, you name it, uh, Frenchmen. British? Uh, <laughs> 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 and the bloody minded Brits, yes. <laughs> Even the bloody minded Brits can save themselves if they want. Uh, if salvation is now open to. If you're a human being, it's there for you if you want, but not if you don't. St. Augustine says, He who created you without you will not save you without you. Augustine's sayings are brilliant. They, they pack a wallop in a few words, often. So uh, the, the Jews refuse, and from then on, they persecute the church. Uh, St. Paul explains that by, with a couple of comparisons of the Old Testament. In Galatians, it, in, in, Roma, in Romans, is Jacob and Esau, the two brothers. And he says these two brothers, one of them was favored by God, that's Jacob, and the other wasn't. And St. Paul says, there's a mystery here. Why does God favor one and not the other? The unfavored one, says St. Paul, is a figure of the Jews, and the favored one is a figure of the Gentiles, of the, of the, of, of the people who will believe and will save their souls. In Galatians, it's another pair. It's Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac uh, is the lawful son of Abraham by, by uh, Sarah. Ishmael is the, is the illegitimate son of the slave, Agar. And St. Paul says... Agar is a figure of the Jews, of the synagogue, we would say. Uh, and and um, uh, Isaac is a figure of the church. And uh, you see the argument in Galatians 4. And uh, this means that from eternity, God has foreseen that the Jews would be, having served by providing St. Joachim, St. Anne, and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all the ancestors necessary to generate those three. Having foreseen that, uh, God uh, has foreseen the answer. He's also foreseen his, the incarnation of his son, his divine son. And he's foreseen, obviously, because he, has, he foresees everything, he's foreseen that the Jews would refuse. Is God going to take, kill off all the Jews? No. 
Is God going to take hold of their free will, shake it by the throat and make them all into Christians? No, because that's not how God deals with people who have free will. If the Jews choose to refuse God, then God will make use of their refusal. And God will have ready at hand a trained instrument by 2,000 years from Abraham to our Lord, especially privileged and trained people with a glorious history of which they are proud, of which they are sinfully proud if they want to sin, but which they will be humbly proud if they are humble. In any case, these people are, are always going to, they're going to be there until the end of the world. Just like in the beginning of Genesis, Cain is a sinner, Cain is a murderer, Cain says to the Lord God, look, please kill me, because wherever I go, people are going to want to kill me, because I killed Abraham, Abel. And the Lord God says, no, you're going to have the brand of Cain, Cain upon you, but you're, 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 you're not going to die, I'm going to protect you. And Cain is undoubtedly a figure of the sinner. Because um, the synagogue brands itself with this hatred of the church. It brands itself. It chooses to brand itself. And of course, down all the centuries, there are always very honorable, very distinguished Jews, genuinely good Jews. And as St. Paul again says in Romans, Gentiles, converts, don't get puffed up. Don't be too proud of yourselves. Because you are merely grafts upon the Jewish vine. Our Lord was Jewish, his mother was Jewish, the twelve apostles are Jewish, the origins of the church, of the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are absolutely Jewish. It is the um, uh, it's it's by choice that the Jews continue down the ages to trample on the church, to do their best. It's how do they how can they they're intelligent people, how can they not see? St. Paul says they have a veil in front of their eyes in 2 Corinthians. They read the scriptures. They read in the Old Testament all the prophecies of the Messiah to come. The Messiah was the purpose of their being who they are, and still they refuse. And they go on down the centuries refusing. The only human explanation, there's, there's no human explanation for, that, for such an obstinacy in refusing the truth when they got in easily enough intelligence to understand. As I say, there are always outstanding converts, and when they convert, they are being grafted back on their, originally their own religion. That's what St. Paul says. Whereas you, and, whereas any Catholics that are not Jewish are grafts, foreign grafts, inferior to Jewish grafts, as long as the Jews genuinely graft, onto, graft back onto our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very difficult for a Jew genuinely to convert. Why? Because this pride is in his bloodstream. It pride is, is, is the heart of it. It's in his bloodstream. I'm not accusing, I'm not... If, if anybody wants to call me anti-Semitic, be my guest. Absolutely welcome. I really don't mind being called... If, that's, if, if being anti-Semitic means that I am against the Jews who are against God, not because they're Jews, but because they're against God, if that's what anti being anti-Semitic means, then I'm certainly anti semitic But I'm also against Gentiles who are against God. This is not a question of being against Jews because they're Jews, it's a question of being against the enemies of God, whoever they are, Jew or Gentile. It's common sense, it's a five-year-old child who understands just the elements. So down the centuries, what's the human explanation of this behavior 2,000 year Enmity, bitter, crushing enmity, hatred of the, of the church and of Catholics, of Christian civilization, Catholic civilization, a curse. Humanly speaking, there's a mystery involved, and one remembers that when our Lord was uh, put by Pilate up in front of the crowd uh, to, to decide whether they wanted to be crucified, they said, crucify him, crucify him. And uh, Pilate said, look, he hasn't done anything wrong. I've, I've examined him, I've tested him, he's not done anything wrong. His blood be upon us and upon our children. And the Jews are very conscious of that. Apparently, I've not checked this, apparently those Jewish American organizations, when they knew that Mel Gibson was making the film about the Passion of the Christ, the Jews understand the power of films. Why do the Gentiles, the, the, why do the Gentiles allow the enemies of God, to, the, insofar as they are enemies of God, to take over the media, to take over films, to take over the universities, because the Gentiles are stupid. Yeah. 
It may not be that the Jews are especially smart, but for sure and certain the Gentiles are stupid. Absolutely right. Yeah. So um, it's, the, it's the Gentiles' fault. No Gentile is going to be able to go in front of the, uh, of, the, of the judgment seat of God and say, it's the Jews' fault. No, 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 the Lord said, that's, that's not true. You chose to submit to their way of thinking, their way of organizing the nations, their way of organizing. You chose, you chose to go along with their new world order. You must take the consequence. You, you, you chose. They manipulate. Yes, true. True, there's, there's a good deal of manipulation that goes on. But at the end of the line, manipulation is still working on human weakness. Yes, it's working on free will. That manipulation includes murder. Oh, well, if, if, that, if, if the manipulation includes murder, then is that, if that soul is in the grace of God, it goes, the Jews send it straight to heaven. Assuming it's the Jews who do the murder. <laughs> but Gentiles do manipulation murdering amongst themselves. Yeah, the, the, the essential problem is not the Jews. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Gentiles is the problem. The essential problem <laughs> is historical is Gentiles. faith or lack of faith. Because later. The one thing that the Jews cannot handle is the, is this faith. And the faith is not kidology. And it's not Protestant. Excuse me, the Protestants amongst you or the atheists amongst you, or I, I, there's no insult or, or disparagement intended whatsoever, but given that, any faith that does not say exactly the same, that faith A, that does not say exactly the same as faith B, one of them may be completely right, one of them, or two of them, must be wrong. No, one of them may be completely right, both may be wrong, one of them is certainly wrong. That's, that's just five-year-old logic. Okay then uh, the faith I'm talking about is not any faith. It's not Protestant faith. It's not chocolate in my breast. Uh, I feel so nice and good. I remember back over in the United States, there was a, a, a seminary, the seminary, the, the novice order seminary down the hill, who wrote a little piece in the newspaper about, oh, when I receive communion, it's I feel chocolate all over. <laughs> <laughs> Religion is not chocolate, and the Catholic Church is not a chocolate club. Please. The Catholic Church is, at its best, at its truest, it's as hard as nails and as gentle as a lamb. It's hard as nails when it comes to pursuing truth. It's gentle as a lamb when it comes to handling poor, poor weak human beings like you and me. Gentleness on people, strictness on doctrine, strictness on truth. Whereas the liberal is soft on truth, he's got mush inside his head instead of grey cells. But he's very harsh on people who don't agree with his liberalism. And I say immediately for that machine, amongst other things, a large number of liberals are Gentiles. And they choose to be liberal. It's their own fault. And it's not the Jews' fault if they're liberals. Well, the Jews may well have had some hand in that. The Jews certainly promote liberalism. That's for sure. Because liberalism helps to undo the Catholic faith. It helps to undermine the Catholic faith. It's a tremendous undermining. And the Jews realize that as long as there's a Catholic faith around, they're not going to be able to dominate the human race. They feel that they are due the dominance and domination of the human race because of those 2,000 years of privileged, glorious, close to God history that they had. And then it, was, it wasn't really taken away from them. But it, it felt they, were, they no longer had that privilege. They were no longer the chosen race. The chosen race was no longer by their race. It was by, um, by faith. Then, ever since, the, the Jew, because of, their, because of their racial pride, their national pride, their religious pride, call it what you will, because they are a nation and a people and a religion, and of course they play skillfully on those three claviers. Oh, yes. When you play on one, they will play on another. When you play on the other, they will play back on the one. They, they play between. But in any case, they are a special race, and what's most special about them is their theological origin, their theological destiny. Mm -hmm. And there is none but a theological solution to the problem that they present. The problem is that they uh, hate the true church with the true faith which God put 
amongst human beings through his divine son in order to enable us to get to heaven. And the Jews do their, do their utmost to stop that because it stops their domination of the world. Therefore, the, if, 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 if the, in line with all of this logic, and I hope, I hope you at least, I don't expect you necessarily to agree, far from it, but you may at least see the coherency and logic of the, of the line of thinking. And it's no other than the line of thinking of the Catholic Church, of the true Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has never been enemy of the Jews as Jews. Never. Often in pogroms, the Catholic Church has protected the Jews in history. The Catholic Church as church has never persecuted the Jews. The Jews have been persecuted by the peoples that could not stand any longer their mystery and by the Jews. But when, that, when, when the people had had enough and the people were reacting and they were murdering the Jews, very often the Catholic Church stepped in to protect them. It's well known that the chief rabbi of Rome, Eugenius Tzoli, yeah. after the Second World War, converted to the Catholic Church because of what he knew Pope Pius XII had done to save Jews, or to protect Jews. That's a fact. Eugenius Tzoli must be an example of those honest Jews who recognize the reality and submit to the reality, which is not discreditable to them. Once a Jew... Un believes in our Lord Jesus Christ and becomes a Catholic, a world opens to him. A complete world opens. The scales fall from his eyes and he's very far from seeing that uh, God from, from our Lord Jesus Christ onwards, our Lord despises Jews or God hates Jews, far from it. But on, on the contrary, a Jew who converts can see that, that he, what, he and his people were meant to, occup to play a, re a leading role in the Catholic Church. And imagine what, how the world would be today if the Jews stopped behaving the way they behave. So many of them stopped behaving the way they're present, presently behaving now. But what St. Paul says is that they will convert at the end of the world, not before. They will convert at the end of the world. That's a scriptural prophecy. It's certain to happen. When exactly, we don't exactly know. The, the, the course of events at the end of the world, we don't know. But they will convert. Right now, I remember reading a Benedictine monk somewhere saying that they are living in the Holy Land, they're occupying, they've plundered, they've stolen the Holy Land, but there are remembrances of our Lord, there are vibes of our Divine Lord all over the Holy Land, and they are now being exposed to that. That's a minor spin-off, you might say, but who knows what effect that may in the end have. In any case, at the end of the world, the Jews will convert. Therefore, the, the logic the solution of the Jewish problem is that every one of us should be Catholic. <laughs> and if there, were, if there were only enough bloody-minded Brits who thumped their way from A to Z, A to Z, through what the church teaches, checked it off against the evidence, checked it off against the evidence, and then decided that after all they want to go to heaven, and then they become Catholic. If, Brit if, if England was Catholic, in Mary England, Catholic England was Mary. England, ever since it was Protestants, has been grey. <laughs> I recommend your book, Boccaccio. It's very good. Um, Boccaccio's a very good book. Italian? The Italian? Yes. Yes. Um, a very good story, Tom. <laughs> He, the, uh, he, he came from Italy, which didn't basically cease to be Catholic at the time of Protestantism. Italy has only ceased to be Catholic in very recent times, like Ireland and Spain. In any case, that I'm sorry not to have spoken about Shakespeare and not to have spoken about Hamlet. We've been wrote. But, but um, where after the things that Our Lady, uh, my Lady said, uh, my Lady said. Uh, I think it was more important to put that before you. You may very well refuse it from start to finish. You are not obliged to accept the penalty. But that is the basic reasoning. That's the reason why. That, 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 that line of argument, I do believe, answers a number of our milady's questions. She, had, she raised in her speech, his speech a number of questions. And I do believe that if you listen and you, you, could, you can fit together these answers to those questions, um, if I were to begin on Hamlet, we would be here until 8 o'clock. I don't think I'd better begin. Hamlet is a fascinating uh, case. 
What, imagine this is a straight line of England following the Catholic faith. Imagine that the Protestantism in England begins to swerve off. Imagine Shakespeare staying on that line because he was Catholic. That's, that's clear. Yes, absolutely. He definitely was Catholic. Um, Shakespeare is pulled by the magnetism, but, but what, what pulled Shakespeare off true? What pulled him was the hatred of what happened to England because of Protestantism. He couldn't bear, for instance, in, in Hamlet, the Queen Gertrude is a figure of the soft, foolish England which chooses Claudius, which chooses Protestant Claudius and rejects, the, uh, rejects her Catholic, her lawful Catholic husband. Her husband is Catholicism, Gertrude is Protestantism, and you get this, this um, language of dark, dark, fair, low, tall. Uh, there's a code language in all of the Shakespeare plays. That's been proved in a marvelous book called Shadow Play by Claire Asquith. Let me put that up. Um, if you're interested in Shakespeare and his Catholicism, Shadow Play. It's a, play, it's a book that was written, I guess maybe 10 years ago, by Claire Asquith, who married into the Asquith family. Oh, sure. um, she's a very smart woman, and, uh, and she, was, she attended in Moscow, her husband's a diplomat, and she attended in Moscow a, a, a play at the theater, and she realized, she's smart, she realized that there was something going on beneath the surface. There was a coded language, mm -hmm. that there was a coded message coming through the play that would escape the communist censors. The communist censors wouldn't see it, but the audience would pick up on it. And she said, hmm, I wonder if Shakespeare did that. And she began looking at Shakespeare, and sure enough, there is, in all of the plays, there is a coded Catholic message to sustain allegory, amongst other things, uh, to, to sustain the Catholics, again, in this bloody persecution. But at the time he wrote Hamlet, Shakespeare, so to speak, lost it. And he swung, of course, out of because of the spirit of Shylock, because of the spirit of revenge. He, could, he wanted to get revenge on the Protestants. And that's why at the end of the play Hamlet, the, the stage is littered with corpses, because Hamlet has smashed the bad guys. He's got rid of the king, he's got rid of the queen, he's got rid of Polonius, he's got rid of Laertes. The bad guys have been gotten rid of, and it's a clean start for the state of Denmark. Um, that, was, that, that must have been Shakespeare's dream. But the interesting thing, uh, and all of this, you know, if you... The interesting thing is that the play is... that, that the, in, in all of the other plays of Shakespeare, not only is there this code, these, coded, these code words like dark, fair. Dark would mean Protestant, fair would mean Catholic. Um, not only is this the coded language, there's also a medieval structure to the play. It's a structure of morality. Uh, the essential drama of Shakespeare goes on inside the individual's soul. It's not society that's to blame. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the soul is either going moving uphill or is moving downhill. There are uphill plays like Measure for Measure and uh, The Tempest, and, then there are, and The Winter's Tale. And then there are many, the, the great tragedies are downhill plays. And therefore, the, the, you've got in, in hand that you've actually got two plays. Which, 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 funnily enough, contradict them. They don't fit together, which is why the play is so interesting and very modern. It's very modern because the whole world has swung off the Catholic course. And therefore, if Shakespeare swung off the course for a moment, he... Um, I must give you one schema. I will, uh, if, uh, if you would like, uh, have a look at Hamlet, Shakespeare, and Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to pervert those around. I'm trying to pervert you, yes. Uh, pass those around. There you are. There should be enough for everyone. Just, this is... We'll have a look. This is, this is the modern side of Hamlet. This is Hamlet as the model and predecessor. There should be enough copies for everyone. Let me know, I've got a few extra here. Please keep passing them around until everybody should have them. Because I think there are, I'm pretty sure there are enough. Um, in case there aren't, there are a few more. Um, um, okay, this is the modern side of Hamlet. 
This is Hamlet as a modern play. I could also present you Hamlet as, the, as a medieval play. For instance, I can't help quoting this, as Othello tramples upon Desdemonia and comes to grief, as Lear tramples on Cordelia and comes to grief, as Brutus fails to listen, there's a beautiful, beautiful scene in Julius Caesar between Brutus and his wife. And, it, and his wife, Portia, realizes something's going wrong inside Brutus. This conspiracy to kill Caesar is eating up her husband. She senses it, and she tries to get it out of him. She says, my dear husband, I'm not, I'm not your harlot, I'm your wife. Tell me the word. If only he told her, she might easily have stopped him from conspiring and killing Caesar. If it opened up to the woman. Uh, Des uh, Thelo tramples on Desdemonia. Leo tramples on Cordelia. Brutus won't listen to Portia. Hamlet tramples on Ophelia. That's medieval. It's not modern. Well, in it, 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 it modern, it's completely different. But Hamlet tramples on Ophelia, and that's just one symptom of the um, uh, of the medieval side of uh, the side that, that Hamlet shares with all the other with the other players. And it does him great damage to trample on Ophelia. It damages his soul. A man cannot trample on women without suffering consequences. And modern men do that. Including Big Floyd. Let's have a look. Hamlet. Uh, down the left-hand column, you've got the story of the play. Let me read it briefly. Hamlet is Prince of Denmark and rightfully heir to the throne of Denmark. Two. But his uncle Claudius has murdered Hamlet's father, incestuously married his mother, usurped Denmark's throne and corrupted Denmark. That's a bad track record. Mm. And remember, that's Protestantism. That's what, for Shakespeare, what will come to that. Three, Hamlet is a, the result is that Hamlet is an exile in his home. His world has crumbled. He is essentially isolated. He contemplates suicide. Four, he takes arms and he lashes out because he can't stand doing nothing. Sounds familiar. The need for men to act. Come on, let's do something. It must be something we can do. Hamlet lashes out. His society, of course, defends itself. The result is a bloodbath. Fortinbras inherits all, and Fortinbras is a numbskull who uh, will fight to uh, kill men for a little piece of land the size of a handkerchief. So says Shakespeare in that form. So we've got the death of the prince. Now look at Shakespeare and see the comparison. The comparison is close. Hamlet is prince, Shakespeare is Catholic. Hamlet is the rightful heir thrown in the mark. Shakespeare was rightful heir to a Catholic England. But the Protestants have murdered Catholic England. They've made it uh, commit incest with heresy. They've hijacked the English people, which has been hijacked ever since. And they have corrupted England in debt. But, uh, but it was the Romans who murdered Christ. The result. Hamlet, ha Hamlet is an exile in his home. Shakespeare feels a stranger in his own land. You can imagine what it must have been like at that time. Catholic England has collapsed. Most English people are going off, going with the flow, as not flow but flow. Close to despair, he writes Hamlet. And then finally. Catholics, close to William Shakespeare, and those are Guy Fawkes and a few cousins of Shakespeare from Gloucester, from Worcestershire, uh, close to... The, the, the Shakespeare was maybe related to some of the gunpowder plotters. The gunpowder plotters said, we've got to do something, and they fell straight into a trap of the Protestants. Just like today, the bad guys lay one trap after another for the good guys, and the good guys, if they are just a little bit too naive, walk into the traps of the bad guys today. Catholics lash out, for instance, with the gunpowder plot. The Protestants trap the gunpowder plot and they torture and execute Guy Fawkes and all of the others. But of course, Guy Fawkes is now burnt in effigy all over the land ever since. We do not have an independence day. We do not have a Republican day. What we have in England is Guy Fawkes day, yeah. which is essentially anti-Catholic. Mm. Mm. For centuries, Catholics will be oppressed in England because of what's happened at the Reformation. Shakespeare has lived through the final decision of England to go Protestant, which only happened at the, uh, towards the end of Elizabeth's reign uh, the, under the Sessions. And their last state is the last state of Catholics is worse than their first. 200 years of suppression until, thanks to the Irish, 
Catholic emancipation takes place in the early 19th century because there were too many Irish workers over here they were too much too needed and therefore they were allowed their religion and therefore the religion the Catholic religion came back to England the second spring it's called now Pink Floyd e.g. for example Pink Floyd is simply an example how many of you know the wall? do you know what? the wall mm -hmm. an album mm -hmm. of Pink Floyd mm -hmm. well it's a classic amongst the rock albums it's a classic the first 12 songs are all negative, and the 12th is Goodbye Cruel World, Suicide. It's a song that made many youngsters commit suicide. But he's against his mother because she smothers him. He's against his father because he got killed in the war. He's against his teachers. We don't need no education. Teachers leave us kids alone. We don't need no education. <laughs> None of you know Pink Floyd or any of you? All right, all right. Well, you do know Pink Floyd. All right, you didn't want to admit it. Any young man since the incarnation is rightful heir to christen. Rightful heir. If he's deprived of that heritage, it's because of some ancestry in his, in his country. But the modern world has, has virtually extinguished Christianity. It has, in, in, excuse me, the, the brief expression, incested it, it infected it, it made it commit incest with secular humanism, it has hijacked virtually all the nations. This is what we are talking about all the time. And it has corrupted in depth all mankind. The whole of mankind is materialistic and more and more materialistic day by day. It's not just Europe. It's all over the world. The young man is surrounded by what ATS ever calls hollow men. Mm. And many a young man today is aware that there's something completely serious missing. There's, there's really something missing. The rock sings. If you want to be, listen to what the youngsters are missing, listen to their rock songs. They don't know what they're missing, but they know that there is something very important missing. And there are many of them constantly mocking the materialistic way of life, and they make a very comfortable yes. material living by spitting all over the materialistic way of life. In other words, by the back door, they're back inside the system. The world is secularized, it's unlivable. Yet everybody seems to be going along. He turns to drugs, promiscuity, etc. I don't know if that's still so much the case today as it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Yes. Finally, he, he, he lashes out. He bashes the policeman or he sings rock. If he bashes the policeman, he's then psychiatrized. He's sent to a psychiatric because he's got a psychiatric problem. The cops are really very nice, don't you understand? But it isn't the cops he's really lashing out at, he's lashing out at the whole darn shebang. Or if he sings rock, he gets millionaireized. In other words, he becomes a millionaire. So either way, he is secularly humanized. Either way, your Pink Floyd rebel is drawn into the system. Shakespeare was not drawn into the system. Hamlet lashed out and got killed. But your modern young man is allowed to get drawn into the system. So his last state is worse than his first. As long as the young man was protesting, there was still some divine spark inside him. But when he accepts to join the system, the divine spark, when he puts on a dark suit and goes to the city, it's over. <laughs> Therefore, the result is the death of the prince, or the deadness of England, or the deadness of modern young men. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of our fortunes, <coughs> fortunes, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them, to die, to sleep, and so on. In other words, should we do something <coughs> with these, all these wretched Protestants hijacking, or have we got to lie down and take it? That's the question. To be or not to be. If I react, I get crushed. If I don't react, the whole world, the world goes its wretched way, and I can't say that I did anything about it. I did nothing. It's insoluble. Either I do not. Well, is it insoluble? King Lear is a much more Christian. There, Cordelia is trampled upon by King Lear, by her father, who can't tell the two dumps that don't live between the two daughters that, that don't like the one daughter that really does, simply because she refuses to say so, whereas they, of course, are full of praise and so on. So. <laughs> And in the end, Cordelia is killed by the bad guys. 
Uh, Cordelia has suffered, 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 got crushed, but that's, that's, the, that's the answer. Shakespeare must have been sane at that time, at that moment in time. You know, Hamlet is not the answer. To lash out is not the answer. Just to, to, to lie down and get crushed. <clears throat> it's a very provocative final statement. All right, well, I have said plenty of provocative things. <laughs> Would you? Uh, 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 So do I. I might, for the mic come, I come where I don't want to have an immortal soul. I'd much rather go down to the pub, pub each night and fool around than have an immortal soul that I've got to answer for. I'd much rather sin until I drop dead. Well, don't worry, I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, religion is much more than a code of conduct. The true religion is the saving of one's soul for eternity. Happiness for eternity or non-happiness for eternity. Well, we can argue about that. You, you don't have to believe that, but do understand that against your view, there is this view that religion is not just a code of conduct. Yes. So the way to wipe out the Jewish problem is their own religion. God says that you've got your Ten Commandments, that most people believe in, and God has said specifically to Jews, not to anyone else, to Jews, you breach these Ten Commandments, you're finished. Right? Is that not right? Now, in their new book, the Talmud, that is a complete tearing up of the Torah, the Old Testament, so that Jews have declared war on their own God. Their own God will support these that, people. Any, the, I'm not knocking anything that's said at these meetings, but you have to have a meeting that everyone can join in. Now, I went to Malaysia, I had a copy of Mein Kampf, a Malay guy said to me, it's a bit early for the Bible, isn't it, sir? <laughs> we need to have, a, and the Jews have created a religion. It took Hitler six months in Latvia to turn people that weren't anti-Semitic into anti-Semites. Now, the Jews have to understand what's coming if they don't reform themselves from within. Because they're not frightened of us. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there's nothing for them to be frightened of in us. But they want to think. Don't they think that the Chinese and the Japanese and the Russians are preparing for some future war? And don't they know that the way to do that will be to infect everyone in America? If they knew, if people knew the things that were in, uh, in, in the, 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 the Talmud, if they knew what... I, I've had arguments in the High Court. I, quote, I have said, and I quote all these leaders of Israel, and I said, these... These Jewish people convert, uh, confirm my reason for anti-Semitism. In other words, I don't quote Hitler. You quote their own statements about us, how low, how revol revolting we are. And that's the way. And they will come down. Regardless of whether we win or lose, they will come down. What we do is a separate question. You're, you're always saying that, oh, if we're not all Catholics, they're going to win. <laughs> Regardless of what we do, they're going down. And if they destroy us all, they'll destroy each other. Because Jews themselves said, give us two Jews, and you've got three opinions. So they will destroy themselves even if they wipe out the human race, as they I'm, see it. I'm not sure that they're going down. 
On the contrary, at the moment, Israel, Israel may be going down, but the Jews are not going down. They're, 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 close, they're day by day closer to complete world power. I'm aware of the fact that there's um, Christian minority in, in Israel or in Nazareth. And, um, you know, it suggests to me that if there are Christians who are Jewish, racially Jewish, and they're voting for the Kurds, you know, uh, just as the religious Jews are, um, Orthodox or otherwise, then it suggests that the, the the ultimate loyalty of the Jewish people is to their race and it has nothing to do with religion. The, that's very true of many Jews. That's why I said earlier, it's very difficult for Jews to truly convert to the Catholic Church or the Catholic faith. It's very difficult because the pride is in his bloodstream. And I don't mean that nastily because I'm very, very nice. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I'm an anti-Themite, I'm still a very nice anti-Themite. <laughs> so, uh, so um, it, 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 it is a religious problem. But it is, and it's not just politics. But, but they're, they're, they're Christians, they <laughs> work for the same political parties. Well, you see, it, I mean, that, that they're human beings, they're weak, they, they're... I mean, politics is always complicated. Maybe there's some good in the liquid. I don't know. Maybe it's simply self-preservation that makes the liquid what it is. I don't know. Right, well, we're out of time there now. Sorry about that. Um...